Not gonna lie, yeah, I'm at the top figure, figure. I don't even wanna be involved with you The way I am because I want it all I tell you, Shawn Michaels, man, just can't get it right. NXT, April the 18th, 2022. 2023, I'm sorry. I wish it was 2022. This show would probably be better if it was the case. It wasn't bad tonight, if we're being honest. It was actually okay. But um, a lot of glaring errors that we're going to talk about here. All right. No news and notes. Uh, nothing that really jumps out at me that's worth talking about. But, you know, in terms of outside of the show itself. So let's just get right into it. Uh, the Gallus defeat the Dyad and the Creed Brothers to uh, hold on to the NXT Tag Team Championships. We started this thing with a brawl, and it actually made me believe that um, it was a flashback from last week. Because I was wondering, like, okay, I didn't think this match was first. So um, the match ended up happening, and let me tell you something. Julius Creed, Freak of Nature. The NXT audience, absolute trash. He was doing a chorus of overhead belly-to-belly -belly suplexes with kip-ups afterwards. He did like six of them before they finally decided to respond. It was crazy, the, guy, the stuff that this guy was doing. He was in this match just being absolutely tremendous. He was the MVP of this match. Julius Creed got something. Physically, he's a marvel. The Creed brothers are tremendous. I'm not saying they should be the tag team champions. I'm saying they're ready. I think they need a little bit of color, the right program, you know, maybe a little bit of seasoning with them. They're ready. They're ready to go. You know, um, as far as the next big tag team, I think we're looking at them with the Creed brothers. They're tremendous. The Dyad lose. Uh, no big deal there. Uh, Ava Rain was backed down by Ivy Nile. Which, of course, teases that Ava Rain and Ivy Nile are going to do something in the future. This would be more interesting if Ivy Nile was, uh, <clears throat> was somebody that this company actually cared about. Uh, speaking of Ivy Nile, I completely and totally forgot that she was uh, singularly chosen to wrestle in reality of wrestling. So she wrestled, I think, Promise Braxton. I wouldn't expect anybody to know who that is. It's a Booker T student. She's actually pretty decent. And Ivy Nile's match with her was actually pretty good, too. Ivy Nile went over to NXT UK, had a pretty good match, too, with um, Mako Satomura. What was this, two years ago during the pandemic or shortly after the pandemic ended? Um, when NXT UK started having uh, shows again. So they've been spreading her around, but they haven't decided to get behind her yet. So the question is, what the hell's going on? Anyway, it seems like she's going to be the first singles opponent for Ava Rain. At least that's what they teased here, whether they actually pulled the trigger on it or not. Unlikely, considering they never actually did Ava Rain versus uh, Thea Hale, and they teased that too. They just kind of very calmly moved away from that. Gallus has a new theme, and it sucks, um, just like all the new themes on this show. Uh, there's uh, there's very few people who have a new theme and it's any good. This one this one sucks too. But Gallus retains. Okay, let's see where we're going with this now. Dijak claims that uh, Ilya Dragunov was the most feared wrestler in NXT until he showed up. The cameraman was like, "But why did you attack him?" And he's like, "I just told you." And shoved the guy, and knocked him over, or whatever. This offended good guy Apollo Crews, who decided he was going to take up for the honor of Milady Cameraman, even though it was a man. And uh, they agreed to have a match later, and th the match, I don't know, it sucked as far as I'm concerned. I don't care about either one of these guys. It was literally tacked on to the show. Uh, Apollo Crews loses to Dijak. Uh, you would think that if these two guys mattered, Overall, to the product, they would actually promote stuff that they're doing. It wouldn't just constantly throw them in on random stuff on the show. But here it is random match nobody asked for that we could have taken some time to build, or I probably wouldn't have been interested even then. It, the fact of the matter is, Apollo Crews is a skid mark in NXT, which is hilarious considering he was actually pretty well pushed on SmackDown and Raw up to a point, of course. And uh, NXT, he seems to have hit the exact damn wall. Like, this guy can't get over anywhere. Uh, 
he might be one of those guys that uh, Dutch Mantel was talking about. You know, when he says that you need to churn guys every once in a while, he might be one of those guys. You know, Apollo Crews might be one of those dudes where AEW will gladly snatch him up. You don't have to, if you are a fan of him, you don't have to worry about him being unemployed for too long. But if you just want to churn out aging mid Carters and you're not, you have nothing. I'm not saying that the guy is terrible. He should be fired, blah, 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 blah. I'm saying that if you got nothing for him, he's been on all three brands. You push him up to a point and then you just stop and he just becomes a jobber. Not interesting, you know, either go all the way, which, you know, means push him at least to the main event. Or churn them. Churn them means cut. Okay, there's gonna be there's gonna be some real cuts going on, and uh, people don't think so, but it will be. Um, it's gonna be mostly corporate, but it will, there's gonna be some talent cuts too. And I, and unless he's gonna become like a producer or something, I don't see any reason why Apollo Cruz is gonna survive the next two or three years or whatever. Um, he was a a big, pretty big star on the indies. He's been in NX. He's been in WWE ten years or something like that now. Enough, you know. Unless they just like having the guy around, I don't see the point of him. The crowd doesn't really get excited for him anymore. Uh, nobody really cares about him in his matches. He's an afterthought. After he loses this match, he's going to get beat up again, and Dragonoff had to save him. And then swarms of security or whatever separated Dragonoff and Dijak. Okay. Uh, I'm not interested in seeing Dijak wrestle anybody. Um, and I actually like Apollo Crews. I, I would have fired Dijak two years ago. So if you're like, well, well, you said Dijak sucks and you're talking about firing Apollo Crews. Like, I would have fired Dijak three years ago. It had been black and gold NXT. I would have fired that fool. I fired that fool 10 minutes after hiring him. I would have watched him go out there and be a stick of chalk walking around like some character from The Simpsons. I would have fired him. He fucking sucks. He blows. He sucks ass and blows at the same time. He, I, I cannot stand Dijak. All right? I don't care what you call him. I don't care how you dress him. They put a mask on him and it still didn't work. I'm telling you, just nothing is working when it comes to getting Dijak crowd reaction. It's just not working. Him being a work rate guy, it sucks. All right, speaking of work rate guy, but this is actually interesting. Nathan Fraser... They did a promo segment, a sort of vignette segment, where he was like a news anchor sitting behind a desk with his hair slicked back and a cup, which I'm guessing is tea. It, do they drink tea and coffee cups in England? No, they do not, right? They got teacups. So that would be, he was drinking coffee? I don't know what he was drinking. Doesn't matter anyway. It was called Hard Hitting Home Truths. And I was like, okay, this song is going to be terrible. So he starts explaining how he got injured in a ladder match. And he has, things have been, haven't been going his way since then. He's gotten close, but he kept falling short. Say so the NXT is cutthroat and everybody in the, uh, in the performance center is quality. And said that he doesn't have time to be sad. He doesn't have time to be depressed. If he keeps moving, speed, move forward unhappiness cannot catch you if you keep moving and i was like hmm okay this actually it makes no sense like literally you're just running from your problem <laughs> you know but at the same time i like that they're trying something with this guy i've been complaining about nathan fraser being a plain bagel for like months now so they're trying something different and okay i wouldn't have let them try this thing different I'm going to give him some breathing room. Let's see what happens. But we need a solid baby face, solid heel situation here. Okay? Moving on. Noam Dar uh, defeats Miles Bourne. Noam Dar has been around forever. They talked about him being around forever. They changed his theme song. So he had the same theme song for seven years, I think. And then <laughs> they changed it out of nowhere. Um, okay. They treat him, at least they're treating Noam Dar like he's a big deal. He's got a vignette before the match and everything and got a pretty, I wouldn't say a lengthy, lengthy match, but the match was enough for, to show his uh, his stuff. I don't know why he decided to wear braids in this match of, of all the time to wear braids. Miles Bourne was his opponent, and I was actually impressed with Miles Bourne. Miles Bourne was not too bad. 
Uh, but Noam Dar is here. I wonder who his first opponent is going to be. They showed a vignette for Roxanne Perez and, and Zoe Stark. Uh, Roxanne Perez says that Zoe Stark preys on the weak, which makes her weak. And then she says that character trumps talent every single time. She wants her title back and will go after, will go through uh, Tiffany Stratton if she has to in order to get it. Uh, this leads to Zoe Stark versus Roxanne Perez, which was a really solid match, you know, between these two girls. They, they actually did good. I was impressed. Um, Roxanne Perez wins the match with Booker T's, uh, corner, um, slam move. That's a kind of a corner sunset flip, which is basically what her finish is. And, uh, after the match, uh, Roxanne Perez was confronted by Andy Hartwell, who offered her a title shot. She was then interrupted by Tiffany Stratton, who uh, made fun of them. And then we end up in a triple threat match. And I, I wanted to throw everything. I cannot believe that e- every single match has to be triple threat, fatal four way. What the fuck? Why? 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 Why does it have to be a triple threat match? Literally, what are we going to gain from this? They're having incredible difficulties getting anybody over in NXT. And this is why. Everything's a fatal four-way. Everybody gets a chance. Nobody gets to, you know, get knocked down and have to crawl their way back up. Everybody gets to squeeze in. You know, it's like nobody ever gets left behind. We're going to squeeze you into the clown car somehow. Sit on somebody's lap if you have to. It's like, no, 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 no. It should have been clear. Tiffany Stratton is the number one contender. That's where it should go. So Roxanne Perez should have said, look, I'll fight the winner. And and that's it. That's it. It's, it's literally that simple. Have her sit outside the ring next week and watch and all that kind of stuff. You just want to keep her involved. But making it a triple threat match is a cop out. You just had this girl. Lose the title without losing. And now she can lose the rematch without losing. What the fuck? Why is Shawn Michaels booking retardedly? These triple threat matches are a waste of fucking time. This stuff is stupid. It never actually fixes the fucking problem. You're going to have a number one contender and a former champion wrestling Indy Hartwell at the same time. Come on, man. Because you don't want Indy to beat one of them one on one. Then why the fuck you give her the belt? If you didn't want her to lose, then you need to book her stronger. If you didn't want to beat Roxanne Perez, then you kick that match down the line. If you didn't want to beat Tiffany Stratton, you don't make her the number one contender. Ultimately, you have to stop being indecisive. This, I I don't know. We're just going to make a triple threat match. What the fuck? Nobody gets over that way. This, this obsession with fatal four ways and triple threat matches is absolutely stupid. It's dumb. This is one of the most overused gimmicks in wrestling. Triple threat matches used to happen sparingly. Now we've got four or five triple threat matches a fucking month. They just had a triple threat match for the tag team titles because they couldn't decide who to give the title shot to. Come on, man. What the fuck? Are we just going to have triple threat matches? Just make... The whole entire card triple threat matches. Wasn't didn't somebody do that before? Somebody did that. I'm pretty sure somebody did a, a, a show where every match was a triple threat match. We might as well just do that now. For fuck's sake. It doesn't even matter who wins. We all lose because nobody's gonna get anything out of this shit. You actually hurting these girls by not challenging them. By not putting them in high pressure positions, by putting it in a situation where they can always unload that shit off to somebody else. Pressure positions is one-on-one when the lights are on bright instead of, well, you could just share the, the light with three other people. Remember, don't forget your spots. This is stupid. It's dumb as fuck. Pretty deadly. Uh, they were very upset. They said that the only way to get through the, the animals like Tony D'Angelo and Stax was to speak their language and said they'll happily play by their rules, no rules, and said that they'll make the D'Angelo sleep with the fishes. I like the aggression here and the slight change of character when it comes to Pretty Deadly. Uh, Stax and Tony D'Angelo were in a restaurant talking about what they did to poor Pauly Montgomery and something along with, the, with a big freezer, which sounds 
dangerous. It sounds awful. Um, then they challenged them to a trunk match. So I'm guessing the losers are going to have to get stuffed in a trunk. It's going to be like a garbage match or a casket match or some kind of contraption match. Uh, we we could have just done a street fight, you know. I, I don't. I want to see how this is going to turn out, but we could have just we could have done a street fight and called it a day. Um, also need for Tony and Stax to be a little tougher, you know. They was talking about you know, Tony D'Angelo's hat and how his uncle Carmine gave him that hat. I'm like, hell no! You should be mad that these guys even put their hands on you. I don't know, man. It's kind of kind of goofy, pretty goofy. Keanu James is in her office doing what she does, whatever that is. Josh Briggs walked in. He wanted to talk to Brooks. Keanu James said that Brooks don't want to talk to Briggs at all. Don't want to see him. Don't want to hear his voice. Briggs says that he needs his little buddy. He misses his friend. He wants to talk to him. Brooks then walks in with his hair slicked back wearing, a, wearing loafers with no socks. <laughs> and, uh... Wow, says that uh, okay, you're you're here now. You know, like did you did they let you in or did you break in again? Uh, he starts, you know, giving Briggs this attitude. Briggs tries to talk to him, and, and uh, Brooks says, "Look, I'm tired of being treated like a little kid. You know, County James treats me like a man. He says he's a man. He makes his own decisions, and he kicked Briggs out. Told Briggs to go." So Briggs leaves. He goes back to the bar, hanging out with Fallon Henley. Uh, Fallon Henley thinks that you know Brooks is going to shake this and he's going to come back and everything's going to be fine. So shortly after she expresses that statement, Brooks shows back up with Keanu James and they're holding hands and they're looking all weird. So Briggs is thinking that everything is good, that they're about to go back to being friends and and all this stuff. He immediately launches into accusations that Briggs has been holding him back and that Fallon Henley is jealous of their relationship. Uh, well, je jealous of his relationship with Kiana James. That she ruined their Valentine's Day because of, their, of, the, of her jealousy and ruined the tag team because of her jealousy. Briggs decided to take up for Fallon Henley because, you know, that's what he's supposed to be the good guy in this situation, even though he helped her gossip and ruin this whole thing. Uh, in the end, Brooks and Keanu James challenged them to a mixed tag team match, to which Fallon Henley says, You want to see the yeehaw? Bitch, get out of my bar. I was like, What? <laughs> this whole thing is. They're, they're in the weeds with this one, dog. I'm not even going to hold you up. It's funny as hell. This Keanu James. Uh, Fallon Henley thing, this shit off the rails, bro. This shit been off the rails for a long time. This dude literally took a week to jump off the track. So now he's dressing like she wants him to dress, and he's completely and totally brainwashed. It's been literally a week. It's been one week. And <laughs> whoever wrote this cuck storyline where this guy is a complete and total cuck who is his girlfriend dresses him. And she thinks for him. It's like uh, somebody who's trying to make a statement here about certain kinds of guys. And it's still not, no guarantee. I saw no hide or hair that this guy has touched even a crumb of Keanu James. So I can't tell you for sure that anything other than the writer's poorly disguised fetish is going on here. But I, got, I, I would be lying if I said that I didn't find it hilariously terrible. Uh, just the twists and turns in this thing is god awful, but it's hilarious. This stuff is happening way too fast. Like for him to be brainwashed that fast after just being told that she was cheating on him last week is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. These are not human emotions. Okay, <laughs> these things are swinging way too fast. But uh, the mixed tag match is going to be something, or I guess it's going to be something or other. It's going to occur. <laughs> it's going to occur. Odyssey Jones is fat, black, and happy to be there. Always. I mean, he's just ever, ever positive, ever optimistic, always with a big smile on his face. This guy is definitely Mark Henry 2.0.
no matter how many times you beat him up, he just comes back big and smiling like you know, Pillsbury Doughboy with black face, just shows up grinning every time, like, hey, hey. It's like, uh what what's uh this ain't working. This has been going on for over a year. It's been going on for like two or three years. Like, it would have been cool if we were just starting with this guy with this and you're trying to set something up like he was trying to be positive and then people beat him down. But this is like three years of injuries and being beaten by everybody in the locker room. We we can't continue this. But I was still thrilled when Brian Breaker speared him and just basically treated him like a chump. This is NXT, of course, where if you're big, you obviously a bitch. And if you're small and very tiny, then you're one of the toughest dudes in the world. Clearly, either AEW or NXT. Only two places where that you find such nonsense. Anyway, Brian Breaker cut a promo. Says that uh, he had to put a stop to Chase U's pathetic uh, celebration. And he called Chase U some clowns. This was interrupted by your boy, Duke Hudson. Who cut a babyface promo. And said that... <laughs> he want Braun Breaker to keep Andre Chase's name out of his mouth. Then he starts talking about being the MVP of Chase University and how he challenges Braun Breaker to a match. And Braun starts to talk again. He's like, oh, he thought I was done talking. He thought I was done talking. He thought I was done talking. I was, I was laughing. I laughed at that because it was silly. And it actually pissed Braun off. He looked like he was very upset about that. And in which case, he, underneath his breath almost, uh, told everybody that the opponent would actually be Andre Chase, and it won't be him. <laughs> so, the this character is a heel character that gets people excited and then heals on them, which is, which is great. Uh, <laughs> when he popped out, I said, didn't he turn heel last week? Like, didn't he run like a bitch last week? When, uh... Brian Breaker did all these terrible things to Andre Chase and Chase University. Like, Duke Hudson split. He got the hell out of there. Um, it seems like everybody forgot that from the cheering section. Now, it took me a while to really notice that he was standing in the Chase U section. So he was hyping them up, and they were hyping him up. And then he healed on them by, you know, it's not me. I'm not going to defend the honor of the university. It's going to be Andre Chase. Uh, <laughs> but this character where he takes all of this glory and then manages to weasel his way out of it is, is good. And it's subtle heel work, but it's, it's still there. Like you have, it's, it's clearly visible heel work where you're like, this guy's a fucking heel at the same time though. He's talking that good shit and he's getting you all hyped up. So you're listening and you're like, yeah, this is absolutely right. And then it's like, wait a minute. What? <laughs> Okay, this works. It's it's unique. I'll give him I'll give him a, a a little bit of space to breathe on this one. I just need Isaac Jones to keep his ass off the floor. Okay, I don't know. I don't know what he did to these people, but he needs to stop doing it. Whatever he did to him, stop doing it. Please stop doing it. All right, Cora J, Gigi Dolan. They had a face to face promo backstage where Gigi Dolan says that Cora J's tirade last week where she was doing a takedown of the women's division was just displaced anger, and her Instagram famous ass is going to kick hers. This match was disqualification bait from the moment it was announced, but this match was terrible, all right? And Gigi Dolan is the problem. She's the problem. Okay, she's not good. Uh, The match... The match went off the rails when J.C. Jane showed up, and uh, she tried to kick Gigi Dolan in the head. Gigi Dolan moved. She then uh, pulled J.C. Jane into the ring. She sloppily tackled her outside the ring. It, it was so, it was awful. She then launched J.C. Jane over the table, which is actually pretty good. This uh, She was outside the ring for a seven count. When she got back in the ring, Cora J hit her with the double arm DDT to win the match. And that was pretty much it. Uh, Cora Jade uh, got back on the microphone. Uh, but Lyra Valkyria cut her off and challenged her to a match at Spring Breaker next week. That that ought to actually be interesting. I'm actually very interested. And guess what? I actually like Lyra Valkyria's promo style. It's theatrical. 
is good. It fits her character. And she comes across as being pretty spooky and intense. I like it. It's, it's not bad. Uh, meanwhile, JC Jane was in the parking lot. So I thought something bad was going to happen to her. She starts to spin in this tale about how Gigi Dolan abandoned her sweet dear brother when she was 17. She left her brother in the, in the house with her abusive mom. And she's not, things are going to get worse for her. If she thinks that what her mom did to her is bad, wait till I get started. And she, of course, was being very expressive, which is her strong suit. And I generally like J.C. Jane. Generally, I think she has a lot of color. She's good. This feud with her and Gigi Dolan is not working out because they're not going for it. They, they come across like they're working light, like they don't want to hurt each other. They need to be poked and prodded into laying their shit in, you know. I mean, making contact, actually knowing how to tackle, you know, <laughs> like Gigi Doma not being able to co to commit to a tackle is poor shit. You know, this is a basic pro wrestling thing to take somebody down and tackle them. I saw earlier in the night, Roxanne Perez was throwing windmill punches. I meant to mention that, but they look like dog shit. Like she looked like, not only could she not break an egg, she probably couldn't rip a wet plastic bag with those windmill punches. And yet, in the moment, you may forget about it because she was somewhat intense in that moment, despite the fact that she looked silly. In these situations, Gigi Dolan does not look intense, and she doesn't come across as intense, but JC Jane plays it like it's intense, so you kind of believe that it's a little bit intense. So um, the way she was selling was very good. How she uses her hands when she talks and her facial expressions and rolling out the eyes and everything. Very expressive. I like JC Jane. I like Gigi Dolan too, but uh, she's still clearly in her shell. Like she's trying to come out of her shell, but she's still clearly tucked deep inside of her shell. She needs to let it go. Like whatever it is she's trying to hold back forget it like you only get one chance at this the company is trying to get behind you as a baby face you need to relax and let it go um you can tell that she's holding something back there's just no there's no use to it just go ahead and do your thing um it might be a mental thing with her you know because maybe it's being a baby face but who knows but jc jane is definitely outperforming her at every turn right now and this match was no good I always thought it was an disqualification, but it was no good. It was not good. It sucked. Uh, Von Wagner is ready to open up because uh, he's begging uh, Robert Stone to be his manager. Like, what? I thought this was a positive thing. I thought this was going to be like Stone Cold Steve Austin where, you know, he's like, I lost on purpose just to get rid of you. But no, apparently he wants Robert Stone there. So he breaks down and starts opening up, telling Robert Stone that, He's always dreamed of being in WWE. I uh, I put my head in my hands. It was like, fuck. Here we go with another one. My dream, my dream, my dream. Oh, I'm so sick of these people and their fucking dreams. Anyway, uh, Von Wagner uh, tells Robert Stone that his dad was one of the Beverly brothers. And it's true. His dad is uh, Bo Beverly, who is, I think his name was Wayne Bloom. Uh, short-lived tag team from the WWF. They also wrestled in the AWA. I think his dad retired in like 93 or 94 or something like that. His dad been retired for a long time. So, um, I, I am not interested in hearing about the dreams of this Crow Magnon by the name of Von Wagner. I am far more interested in you throwing a mask on him or taking him and putting some kind of gimmick on him. If he's going to come out and be a Beverly brother, because that's what his dad was. I this is it's going to be hilarious for starters. It's going to be funny. It's going to be very embarrassing. But then again, being Von Wagner is pretty embarrassing. So uh, let's go for it. Put him in the purple tights. Get him a get him a cape. <laughs> oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's turn him into Von Beverly. Let's do it. Wag Von Wagner Beverly. Put a Put a hyphen in that bitch. Why not?
You know, it's not like he, it's not like he's over and you're ruining it. You're basically just telling everybody what people already know. So uh, that sucked, and uh, we have to continue with this now, I guess. Axiom says that Axiom is his identity, and that Scripps is not his nemesis, not his supervillain. But he will defeat Scripps and expose him. So they're going to have some kind of mask versus mask match. Let me tell you that I'm not interested in that. Not at all. How about we just unmask both of them and make them a tag team or something? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the new high energy. High energy. <laughs> hey, you ever watch those old high energy uh, promo segments and Coco Beware just randomly at the very end of the promo? High energy. This is so terrible. Yeah, make uh, Axiom and Scripts like the new high energy. Uh, that would be fun, right? Two small guys who do flips and shit. That would be great. You know, at least for a little while. Until I get bored and want to throw him into a wood chipper. Tank Ledger went backstage and was very happy about his debut, despite the fact that he lost. Because, hey, who cares about winning and losing and wrestling anymore? It's all about the experience and the energy, bro. So he starts talking about the energy from the crowd. I'm like, the energy from the crowd? Man, the energy from that crowd couldn't move, you know, anything. This crowd sucks. That arena sucks, okay? But he was talking about the energy from the crowd, and he can't wait for Danny to debut. She's going to feel the energy from that audience. And I'm like, ugh. And um, it was a bunch of people in the performance center circling around, some people in the ring tumbling, and so Rook is there dancing. I'm like, this is NXT UK shit all over again. Where it's like parts episode of Saved by the Bell, where it is like a bunch of people doing stuff, like, they're in the training part of the facility, playing around, joking with each other. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I like that. He did that shit a lot in NXT UK, but whatever. I mean, you got a performance center, you might as well use it, right? Just saying. Um, it's just very weird. But this is all about more teasing of uh, Danny, uh, Danny Palmer's debut. You got Eddie Thorpe. He is wearing a choker. Uh, shirts with the buttons all the way down. It was tucked in, but his inflection incredibly feminine, and that immediately took me out. I didn't understand anything he said after that point. I was just kind of like, "Is this doing a gay Indian? Like, is 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 that what this is? Is he a gay Indian?" And yeah, he said something about. Uh, Paying his dues, sleeping on dusty gym floors, um, uh, wanting to make his family proud, and something about uh, stereotypes about Native Americans. I'm like, bro, do Native Americans call them Native Americans? Like, would you? We need more Tatanka, less whatever this is. All right, this this is mm -mm. this ain't working for me, Eddie Thorpe. You need to change your name to, like, a uh, running bull or something, okay? Like, that's what we, that's what I'm looking forward to, okay? If you're going to be Indian, go full fucking Indian, all right? Your name should be, like, Sitting Rock or something like that. And you should have, like, war paint and feathers. I'm saying be colorful, be loud, you know, Tatanka. Uh, Jay Strongbow, you know, um, what was the kid's name that was the tag team partner of Ricky Steamboat? He was, uh, Youngblood, Jay Youngblood, just, just, let's go, get in there, don't do the Indians what we've happened, have happened to Cowboys, we got Fruitcake Cowboys, now we're gonna have Fruitcake Indians, are you guys warriors, or are you going to a tea party, what's happening here? You are DJ at what kind of clubs, may I ask? Because these ain't the kind of clubs I think I want to hang out in after listening to this guy talk and looking at how he stands and everything. I'm very concerned. Your name should be Lightning Foot or something, right? And you should be a badass Indian guy. 
Why not? There's been badass Indian guys all up through wrestling. I I I am perturbed every fucking Wednesday when I see the the modern day cowboy with the frills and you know the the depression, the alcoholism. Ah. You know, I think of cowboys, I'm thinking like a Wyatt Earp. I'm thinking Lone Ranger. You know, or in wrestling terms, Stan Hansen or Black Jack Mulligan. We stuck with fucking Adam Page as a modern day cowboy. It sucks. All right. When I think of Indian wrestlers, I'm thinking, obviously, I've said Tatanka's name six times already. I'm thinking Tatanka. I'm thinking Chief J. Strongbow. I'm thinking J. Youngblood. Not this. What is this? This is like some Tatanka meets Rick the Model Martell shit. This sucks. All right. Fix it. Sean, do what you do. You wrestle Tatanka, okay? Chief J. Strongbow, I'm pretty sure, was a road agent. Well, he's not a real Indian. He's like Italian. So I shouldn't even... Why am I I using that guy? He's not even a real Indian. Ah, yes, fake Indians. So many fake Indians. I'm going to tell you a story about how my heart broke, Okay. We're going off into the weeds on this because we're talking about fake Indians. Now, I should have been talking about Wahoo McDaniel. He's a real Indian. The guy who does the commercials with the tear, not a real Indian. I'm telling you, I was fucked up when I first heard about it. The guy is Italian, just like uh, Chief J. Strongbow is an Italian, just like Muhammad Hassan, not a real Muslim. Guy's Italian, <laughs> you know. That's like uh, Mark Merrow, not black, not really the same race as Little Richard. Guy's fucking Italian. Something about these Italians, they get they get in the wrestling business, and all of a sudden, either they're they are they pretend to be Indians or, or niggas. Well, they're one of the two. So I'm just like, wow. But I'll tell you, I was heartbroken when I found out that that the guy they was using in these commercials to to make us feel bad. About about the about what we do to the environment, about me throwing Doritos bags on the on the ground as a kid, wasn't a real Indian. Like Hollywood, they fuck with you so badly. They make you feel like look at these look you making the Indians cry, dog. Look at you, you're making the Indians cry. And then you look it up. Ain't no fucking real Indian. That guy's fucking Italian. That sucks. It's Hollywood. So uh, yeah, Eddie Thorpe. Uh, no gay Indians, please. No, no metrosexual Indians, please. If you if you can't be something masculine, then go back to Japan. Uh, just just go back. I have no, we have no interest in this. Go back to Japan. Anyway, for some odd reason, Damon Kemp is interested in him. I don't like where this is going. This is going down some dark streets, and. Uh, I'm not a fan. Eddie Thorpe. Ugh. Yeah, buddy. It ain't looking good for you, brother. All right. Uh, Wesley defeats Charlie Dempsey in a match that frustrated the hell out of me because I wanted Charlie Dempsey to win this match so badly. Not just because I hate Wesley, but because I like Charlie Dempsey. And they had Drew Gulak assault uh, Wesley before the match. And then he assaulted him after the match, too. <laughs> Uh, Dempsey and Wesley had a pretty good match, man. Um, I hate that this is the position Dempsey is in. I don't, they, they're not even doing a really good job of building contenders for Wesley. He's just having random matches and winning, which, you know, I guess since he's the work rate champion, that's okay. But to me, it's been fucking boring. We need, this guy needs to be a part of a storyline, storyline. Okay. Something needs to occur instead of him just wrestling randos every week. Um, After the match, it seemed like Drew Gulak might actually challenge him next. It would be just like Shawn Michaels to put the belt on fucking Gulak or something, but uh, hopefully they don't do that. But it looks like Gulak is going to challenge Wesley next. Oh, boy. Okay. So they had a vignette where I wasn't sure if it was an in your house commercial or what the fuck was going on, but it was like random objects flying through the air and crashing onto the ground. And I'm looking like, okay, what's happening here? 
And it's like a big black dude. Oh, by Femi. He's just throwing shit. His gimmick is that he throws shit. And he's throwing like a couch. And it's like a television. It's like an old boom box. I'm like, where did... Why is any of this stuff in an open field for you to grab and throw? <laughs> why, why is any of this stuff within arm's reach for you to grab and throw? Can, can we explain this? Or are we just going to skip over that and just go into it? The dude's huge. I mean, he's a big guy. All right? He's a big dude. Uh, I'm not going to... Hey, you can't, can't put that over enough. He's a big guy. Big dude. But... uh. What is he? Why do you have a boombox? And why was he throwing it? Why was he throwing a couch? Why? Um, my only guess is that he probably has some kind of javelin shot put background. But just because he has like a javelin shot put, I throw shit background. Why is throwing shit a part of his gimmick? <laughs> like, I don't, is he going? Is is his finisher going to be throwing people over the top rope like the berserker or something like that? Because if so, that could be fun. Like if his gimmick is going to be, I pick you up and throw you over the top rope in a hilarious fashion, you know, that, that might get over. You know, if you pick up, you know, big enough dudes, it'll definitely get over. You know, I'm just going to start chucking people. That might work. You know, uh, it's been, it's been a while, you know, um, but otherwise, uh, but he, apparently he's going to debut next week. So, he doesn't look like he's uh, big, black, and jolly like uh, <laughs> Odyssey Jones. <laughs> so, <laughs> it might work out okay. Uh, okay. The closing segment was the Grace of Waller effect. Grace of Waller, Carmelo Hayes. Uh, this segment was essentially Carmelo Hayes talking about his accomplishments, saying that Grace of Waller doesn't have any, and Grace of Waller thinking he's a big star without the title, but we'll take it. Any from uh, Carmelo Hayes anyway. Uh, that was essentially the, the 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 crux of their conversation is that Carmelo Hayes thinks that Grayson Waller is a choke artist who shoots bricks, and of course he is him and he don't miss. And Grayson Waller is I'm I'm the biggest star on NXT, the most viral, and I got a boot. I'm gonna drink out of this boot. I'm like oh. You know damn well if your gimmick was drinking out of a shoe and Vince McMahon was around, you'd be drinking out of a shoe every damn week. You wouldn't you would drink you would eat spaghettios out of that fucking boot. You better be lucky Triple H is in control of this and understands the the culture behind shoeies. Otherwise Vince will have you eating every fucking meal out of a boot. Gotta stick to the gimmick, pal. Eat your steak out of this boot. Oh fuck! He's like Full Metal Alchemist, he gonna fuck around and eat the boot. This is I can't, it's just, it's just stupid fucking gimmick. Ah, it's not even a gimmick, really. It's just kind of a thing he does. You know, a gimmick is something he uses to get over. He's not using it to get over. He's just kind of doing shit. You know, he's doing it because it's annoying, and uh, people hate to see him succeed. Um, but <laughs> if you drink out of his shoe, that's your own problem. Uh, the, the segment was, eh, it was okay. It wasn't awful. It wasn't great. The, as typical of the Grayson Waller effect, they go too long. They trip over each other. They say the same thing over and over again. He is I and I am him. Uh, okay. Uh, you did, they did have Grayson Waller try to drive a little bit of a wedge between Carmelo and Trick. By saying that Carmelo wouldn't have anything, he wouldn't have any of his accomplishments without Trick Williams. Trick Williams got frustrated, got upset, stood up, but Carmelo calmed him down. So they they're gonna have a good match next week. They're gonna have a hell of a match. Um, problem with this is I don't. This is a good match. This is how things should be booked because Grayson Waller is probably not going to win. And that's okay, because as a character, he can take losses and bounce back. That's all he's been doing over the past year or so is taking L's and bouncing back. And occasionally he wins more than he loses. I think he wins more than he loses, but when he does lose, he bounces back pretty quickly. Because um, he can talk. You know, if you actually 
develop people's personalities, they can take losses. Huh, how about that? You don't have to do a triple threat match. You don't have to do a fatal four-way match or anything like that. But they are teasing Trick Williams turning on Carmelo Hayes. And uh, that's really got some people up in arms. I I would not break them up it, personally. I like them together. But I don't know if they're talking about the draft. They might pull Trick and not Carmelo. So who knows? Um, the draft was kind of an important part of this show, too. It was mentioned a couple of times. And I'm thinking maybe that's why certain things are happening. Maybe that's why that triple threat match is happening. Maybe that's why that triple threat tag team match happened. Is because, you know, some people are about to leave. Who knows? There's definitely going to be people leaving. I'm tired of every week NXT we sit here and try to guess who's leaving. But um, people will definitely be leaving. And that's definitely going to dictate the booking decisions that they're making. But ultimately, I think the... The segment was okay. I don't. I think they definitely have had better Grayson Waller effects, but uh, he's still doing a very good job on the mic. Carmelo Hayes is a good promo. They kind of got tripped over each other because they're trying to see who can be cockier than the one before, and it comes across like two heels arguing rather than a heel and a babyface arguing. But it was okay, I guess. Um, so that was NXT. Uh, they could have kept Dijak and Apollo Cruz. Um, if they had gave more time to other elements of the show or other characters, then it probably would have been better. Again, sometimes one fewer match can really help uh, flesh out something. Uh, Gigi Dolan really needs some help. She is not uh, blossoming the way that we would like. And right now, she is being outperformed by all of her peers. Cora Jade is much better at cutting promos than her and showing fire and intensity. Uh, Zoe Stark is even better at cutting promos and showing fire and intensity. Uh, Roxanne Perez, um, no, no, she's a gingerbread girl. It's uh, she's just happy to be there, you know. But at least she came up with something. That was moderately good in terms of her promo when it comes to character being better than talent. I thought that was nice. But um, I'm seeing at least some growth from everybody except Gigi Dolan. And uh, I need her to get it together. But what do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section below. I will talk to you guys later. Peace. Mongo Slay. Best house I ever do, Daddy. <laughs>